So, good morning. My name is Bruce Mitchell. I'm from the University of Waterloo. And my job is simply to uh, welcome you on behalf of the University of Waterloo. Uh, Waterloo is very pleased to be a partner with CG and the Royal Society of Canada in this event. You will be aware from the information outside that it is this year that the university is celebrating or marking its 50th anniversary. It was started in 1957. And this event is viewed as one of the hallmark events for the anniversary celebrations of the university. Two of the sessions on Friday, the one on energy pathways uh, facilitated by Keith Heipel and the one on environment, sorry, energy and environment policy organized by Jennifer Clapp and Ian Rollins were the University of Waterloo's uh, contribution to the full program. You will have noticed out in the material in the foyer that the tagline for the 50th anniversary, which I think is also relevant to this conference, is a quote from George Bernard Shaw. And he made the following observation. You see things that are and ask why, we dream of things to come and ask why not. So the first part of it, you see things that are and ask why, is a very good tagline, I think, for any university. Uh, the curiosity to understand what is happening. But the University of Waterloo has always tried to create a culture where others will say, well, you can't do this or you can't do that. Uh, the alternative perspective is to dream of things still to be or still to come and say, why not? And I think that's a little bit what this conference is trying to do in the dialogue, is to try to identify different things and ask, well, why not? Why couldn't these be done? So as others have done, I would also like to acknowledge and recognize uh, people who have made a major contribution. And since I'm here from the university, I would like to recognize Jennifer Clapp, Amma Chakma, Keith Hypo, and Ian Rowlands, who are all members of the program committee, along with people from CG. And uh, Keith and Jennifer also wear CG hats, uh, so they have a split loyalty in, in that kind of activity. Uh, and the Royal Society to, uh, to organize this event. And it's been a real pleasure to work with Ramesh and John. And particularly, I think John and Ramesh and I would like to acknowledge Tamara Azur, who is the person who has really helped to make all this happen. Uh, so with that, I'm pleased to introduce Louise Frechette, who will introduce this morning's session and start it off. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce, and good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to this second day of uh, CG07, which is dedicated to the issues related to nuclear energy. And I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to present to you the project which I am currently chairing at CG, and which is entitled Nuclear Energy Futures, Implications and Options for Global Governance. Now, when I first started talking with John English about joining CG, he suggested I might want to do a project on UN reform. And my answer was, I'd rather die. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> my choice of project was influenced by two things, one of which is connected to UN reform, in the sense that our conversations took place shortly after the conclusion of the 2005 UN summit, which resulted in a declaration that was totally silent on nuclear issues and disarmament issues in general. And at the same time, there was another phenomenon that was starting to appear, which was evidence of renewed interest in the nuclear option for the production of energy in the uh, number of countries because of growing demand, the price of oil, because of uh, concern to reduce uh, greenhouse gases emissions. So I saw in these two, two issues the impasse in which the UN found itself on nuclear questions and this trend relating to the return to the use of nuclear energy 
uh, a potential for CG to make a useful contribution in this field of concentration, that is global governance. And I'm really very grateful to CG, uh, to Jim Balsley and, uh, and John English and the whole team at CG for the tremendous support that uh, our project has received. Now let me tell you first what the project is not about. Our project will not try to determine whether or not the nuclear energy option makes sense from an economic point of view. It will not try to determine whether or not nuclear power can be exploited in a safe and secure manner. It will not try to determine whether or not nuclear wastes can be stored safely. All these issues are legitimate and they will come up any time a government considers the nuclear route, but they're not the focus of the project. Our project is concerned with the adequacy of our global governance tools in the nuclear area. By this, I mean the collection of institutions, international conventions, agreements, and other arrangements which deal with a broad range of issues related to nuclear energy, security and safety issues, transport and trade in nuclear materials, disposal of nuclear waste, and of course, non-proliferation safeguards. We will therefore definitely look at the NPT and the IAEA and all the other conventions that are related to this mother of all nuclear conventions. However, we will want to stay away from the politically charged issues of Iran's suspected nuclear intentions and how to deal with it, since many think tanks and research institutes are already doing some very good work on that subject. We will want to assess whether the governance tools I mentioned a moment ago we will want to see whether they are sufficiently comprehensive, whether there is adequate monitoring capacity, whether they are effectively applied and complied with, and we will want to identify ways to improve their effectiveness. The project is taking place over three years and we're approaching the end of the first year. And it has three distinct phases. In the first phase, we're trying to determine the magnitude and the shape of this expected nuclear renaissance. How many new power plants? Where? Using what technology? And what considerations are driving governments uh, when they look at the uh, nuclear energy option? And I'm happy to report that you are phase one. You are part of phase one <laughs> of, the, of, the, uh, of the project since the discussions today have been organized around this question of the nuclear renaissance and the, the shape and size of it. We'll have a few uh, case studies and we will have also a speaker addressing the issues of the, of, of the drivers, the consideration that enter into government uh, decision. And uh, we'll talk about that more in a minute. In the second phase, we will conduct a systematic review of the governance tools I mentioned a moment ago, with a view to assessing their adequacy and effectiveness and identifying possible improvements. And in the third phase of the project, we will uh, prepare a comprehensive report which will draw conclusions from our research and offer practical recommendations. And this report should come all in the fall of 2009. So definitely we are doing our research with a purpose and it will have an end date with some conclusion and recommendations at the end of it. As chair of the project, I feel very fortunate to have found the perfect person to direct this project. He's sitting right here. He's Trevor Finley who in addition to his responsibility as a CG fellow and director of the project, also teaches at Carleton University and is the director of the Canadian Centre uh, on Treaty Compliance. Trevor is seconded in his work by a small research staff, but we will also draw on the law knowledge of international experts in the field through commissioning papers and holding small conferences and workshops, some in partnership with foreign research institutes. Now, before giving the floor to Trevor to kick off the day's discussion, I would like to thank in advance our panelists and lunchtime keynote speaker for accepting our invitation. I'm sure you will agree with me that we're very lucky to have assembled in one room so much knowledge and expertise about nuclear energy issues. I look forward to their presentation and the exchanges that will follow with you. 
So on this note, I hope, uh, I hope I'm confident that we will have a very interesting and productive day. And I turn the floor over to Trevor Finley, who will um, introduce this whole question of the nuclear uh, renaissance. So Trevor, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Louise, very much. And uh, I'm delighted to see so many people here interested in nuclear power on a cold, rainy Saturday morning. So welcome, everybody. Uh, my role this morning, as Louise has said, is to set today's panels in the context of the CG Nuclear Energy Futures Project. And to that end, I want to walk you through the logic that we're using for our research uh, on phase one of the project. Uh, in particular, I'll talk about the uh, concept of drivers and constraints that we're using. Uh, we've constructed this rather simple uh, concept of how to look at the things that are driving and the things that are holding back uh, nuclear energy demand uh, globally. I'll explain the details of that uh, later on. And we're also adopting a scenario-based approach. Given that we think the factors are so complex in driving this so-called nuclear renaissance, that it will be difficult for us to crystal ball gaze and get any one set agreed view on where this is heading, but rather we would be uh, forced to look at various scenarios uh, from low, uh, medium through to high. And finally, I'll talk about the structure uh, of today's panels and how this relates to our uh, research goals. As Louise has said, there is a certain logic to our project. Uh, part one is what's the likely size and character of the predicted nuclear revival in the coming two decades. So the coming two decades is the window that we're looking at. Uh, secondly, what are the implications for global governance? And thirdly, what steps should be taken uh, to ensure global government, governance manages uh, this predicted nuclear energy revival? So the first part of the project is uh, what is the size and character of this uh, likely nuclear revival? Uh, in terms of size, we're interested in which countries, uh, in which regions, uh, and which, which countries in particular are likely to go for the full uh, range of nuclear uh, energy programs. We'll also be looking at countries uh, like Sweden, Belgium, and Germany, which may revisit their earlier decision uh, to give up the nuclear option. We're concerned with how soon countries are likely to go nuclear, as it were, and how long until the first sod is turned on their so-called new build. Uh, in the past, it's sometimes taken decades for nuclear plants to uh, become reality, and uh, we're not absolutely certain that this will change in the future. How long a nuclear revival takes to become reality will determine how soon the nuclear governance arrangements will, ha will be required. We're, of course, already aware that today a significant expansion is envisaged in countries that already have nuclear power, so China, France, Japan, Russia, South Korea, Canada, and the United States. A key question, given our global governance interest, will be to what extent a nuclear revival moves beyond the established nuclear energy players to new entrants, especially countries with less robust safety, security, and non-proliferation credentials. A related question is, of course, how? What choices will countries make about the fuel cycle in terms of fuel type, reactor type, and disposition of spent fuel? Will states be content with importing both fuel and turnkey reactor projects? What type of reactors will they choose? Will they go for ordinary thermal reactors or third or fourth generation reactors? And importantly, how proliferation resistant will these be? Will they lead to further nuclear weapons proliferation or will they help in constraining proliferation? How many will seek the full fuel cycle, including reprocessing uranium uh, and enrich sorry, enriching uranium and reprocessing plutonium in an attempt to achieve energy independence. And what will be the effect of all this on the levels of trade and transport uh, in nuclear materials? So to study this uh, rather complicated uh, set of issues, we've adopted perhaps a rather simplistic concept of uh, drivers and constraints. We rightly speak of the nuclear energy revival as global in scale, but in fact it will be the accretion of uh, various national governments' decisions about whether to go nuclear or not. And in that we're very aware that there are pressures on governments to go nuclear, have more nuclear, 
or, on the other hand, not to go uh, nuclear. So we thought the concept of drivers and constraints was a useful one. Obviously, though, this is an analytical tool, and it has its uh, certain limitations, and it's necessarily artificial, given that the drivers and constraints are often very closely interrelated. They react with each other, against each other, uh, so we're facing a rather complex uh, situation. For instance, if the nuclear industry advocates push too hard for nuclear power, uh, there could be a public backlash, which in turn lessens the likelihood of uh, a significant nuclear uh, renaissance. So there's an action-reaction uh, aspect going on here. Uh, with something like climate change, for instance, clearly that's a driver in many people's view in terms of acquiring a nuclear option to deal with uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but also thermal reactors require a lot of uh, water. So if you're thinking about climate change, we actually may not be able to situate nuclear reactors on rivers anymore as river levels drop due to climate change. So that's both a driver and a constraint on, on the nuclear industry. To complicate matters, there are also enabling factors that neither drive nor constrain, but are simply there. They facilitate, maybe they don't favor nuclear, for or against, but they're simply uh, there as background uh, factors. Uh, for instance, nuclear uh, regulations imposed by states or internationally are clearly a, a background factor. So with all these caveats, I'll proceed to uh, chance my arm and talk about some of the uh, illustrative drivers and illustrative constraints. These obviously aren't uh, exhaustive, but just the ones that we've identified uh, so far. Clearly, uh, on the economic side, uh, there is economic growth and the demand for electricity. Uh, in this case, those considering nuclear power will have to also consider the uh, competitiveness of nuclear power with traditional energy supplies, uh, with newly emerging uh, energy uh, types, with uh, economies of, of scale. For instance, if the nuclear renaissance really does take off, then perhaps uh, nuclear will become more uh, uh, cheap and will be uh, more likely to be adopted. And particularly, as came out from yesterday's discussion on energy generally, uh, the question is whether the price of carbon will be monetarized and how that will be uh, factored into economic uh, and particularly investor decisions about whether to go nuclear. The price of uranium is also clearly a factor. It may rise or fall, uh, either encouraging or discouraging investors. On the technical and technological side, uh, there are claims that new generation reactors are cheaper, safer, more secure, more proliferation resistant. Uh, I think the jury is still out on many of those, but this will be part of the uh, debate. Those who claim these have been achieved will, will say that this is a driver of uh, the nuclear race, renaissance. The more, the more skeptical uh, observers will seek to pull back the move to nuclear as a result of these. There's also the factor of extending the life of existing uh, plants, which apparently is now quite successful. So will, they, will those factors obviate the need for new uh, build, as the industry calls it, as opposed to extending the life of, of existing plants? On the environmental drivers, clearly climate change uh, is a driver. Uh, we've all seen from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, its reports how there's this growing consensus about climate change, and many people mention in the same breath the possibility that nuclear will be part of uh, the solution to the, the problems posed by climate change. There is another environmental issue, of course, and that is the question of nuclear waste, uh, and we'll be touching on that in uh, today's presentations as well. There is apparently a scientific, uh, a growing scientific agreement that the problem of nuclear waste is uh, uh, handleable in a technical sense, but of course uh, the political factors uh, are holding back uh, plans for actual nuclear waste uh, repositories. Finally, the political factors, and here I would just say that in a sense everything is political when it comes to nuclear. This is a very politicized issues, issue, so all of the factors I've previously mentioned have their political uh, dimensions. But in terms of the drivers, there are clearly national political pressures from various quarters now to revisit uh, the nuclear issue. Uh, public opinion is changing on this. In fact, our project is commissioning a study on how global public opinion is changing. Uh, governments are in turn changing their minds. Industry has renewed enthusiasm in a way that uh, we have not seen now for decades. 
There's also, also international enthusiasm, obviously, some coming from national governments with international pretensions. The Global Nuclear Energy Partnership from the United States, of course, does have the, that global reach. But also international organisations like the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, are looking at the whole question of how big this renaissance is going to be and what they can do to facilitate that. And we'll be hearing indeed from uh, a guest from the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, later today. What are some of the constraints? Well, we go through the same categories and clearly uh, on the econo economic side of it, investor uncertainty is, is one, especially in a deregulated energy uh, industry. The ind industry's really changed significantly since the early, uh, earlier nuclear uh, golden age and uh, investors are very uncertain about what uh, the uh, uncertainties portend for the money that they're planning to invest in this industry. There's still a widespread view that government subsidies of some description will still be required and publics may of course uh, rail against that idea. And we had the whole debate yesterday about the varying uh, economics of uh, varying types of energy. So that will, will play into, into uh, the factors. Uh, new build, as the industry calls it, uh, will be costly. And if there is a, a major renaissance, there'll be clearly competitions for labor, for uh, finance, for actual materials when you think of the amount of concrete that China requires for its current building uh, expansion, you see that there is a, a competitive situation going on there. On the technical and technological constraints, as I said, some of the uh, new uh, reactor technologies prom promised are still on paper. They're still being investigated. It's not exactly clear what their capabilities will be, and particularly in the area of so-called proliferation uh, resistance. There's also a shortage of nuclear engineers and other key personnel. Uh, Canada let its capabilities, for instance, in this whole nuclear engineering uh, field uh, decline in the past decades, as many other countries have done. So there is a shortage of skilled personnel, and again, there will be a competitive situation when it comes to supplying uh, any new nuclear industry. And finally, accidents do happen. Uh, I'm not the first one to point out that if there's another Chernobyl this could kill the nuclear renaissance stone dead. So we always have to bear in mind that, that uncertainty. Environmentally, there is no, at, at present, uh, publicly acceptable, politically acceptable solution to nuclear waste. So it's the politics here which play into uh, the constraint rather than the, the technical aspects. And also on, on the environmental side, nuclear may not be quick enough because of the very slow, long lead times for nuclear. It may not be able to deal with what many scientists now say is uh, portending catastrophe. It simply may not be part of the game quick enough. And even the most optimi optimistic scenarios don't talk uh, much beyond perhaps a doubling of nuclear capacity, which is already not, uh, doesn't feature very largely in many countries' uh, power uh, systems. Finally, on the political, public opinion is still uncertain. The polls show that it can go up and down, and it would clearly go down if there was another major catastrophe. The public is still doubtful about safety and security in particular. They're not absolutely sure that uh, these uh, worries have gone away. And I would suggest that uh, since 9-11, fears about uh, possible attacks on nuclear power plants and other nuclear facilities have grown. Uh, and, and despite this, the public still seems to be warming to nuclear power. But it, as I say, it would only take one major incident for this to uh, change. Uh, clearly, the hidden elephant in the room in this sense is uh, nuclear proliferation. There is a perverse uh, situation going on in the sense that we suspect some countries are pronouncing their uh, desire to obtain nuclear energy as a hedge against neighbors or future threats, uh, states who themselves are seeking to acquire nuclear weapons. So the concept is you acquire the full uh, range of peaceful nuclear capabilities, which you then convert into a nuclear weapon capability uh, if and when you're threatened or in advance of a threat. And talk from some of the Gulf states uh, about having new nuclear energy programs or beginning them uh, clearly has Iran in mind. Uh, the situation with Iran and its nuclear capability is, un is uncertain and there is uh, the fear that countries will use this uncertainty as a pretext for uh, nuclear energy uh, programs which otherwise do not make any uh, economic or, or political sense. So what kind of revival are we thinking of straight away? 
Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we're taking a scenario approach. We're worried about being uh, crystal ball gazers. We're very conscious of international reports in the past which have predicted all sorts of things and they've never come about. So I guess we're going to take a conservative approach and look at various scenarios. Uh, the high tide would, as I've called it, I've used some rather jazzy labels to, uh, to enliven the topic. Uh, the high tide would be restricted to nuclear weapon states, which already have peaceful programs, and those with existing nuclear power capacities, good safety and security standards, with some exceptions, and all of them NPT compliant, uh, except India, obviously. So that list of states is pretty much those that already have uh, nuclear power. Uh, moving on with the uh, rather Australian term, the big surf, uh, there would be an expansion mostly in existing nuclear states and some developing states, and some indeed with questionable safety, security and non-proliferation credentials, uh, and some seeking the full nuclear fuel cycle. So here's really where the governance aspects start to bite. And uh, this is just an illustrative list. This may or may not happen, but these are some of the countries we're actually looking at. Uh, and finally, a tsunami, as I've called it, an overwhelming increase in uh, demand for nuclear energy by developing and developed states, large increases in nuclear reactor numbers, producers of nuclear material, exports and imports of nuclear material and technology, large increases in the transshipment of hazardous waste, the storage of hazardous waste, including high enriched uranium and plutonium, and many countries indeed uh, seeking the full fuel cycle. So today's panels, we're structured pretty much along the lines of this research uh, outline I've given you. Uh, we start with uh, some of the key drivers, economic, technical, environmental, and constraints, and we've invited three speakers to pretty much confine their remarks to these particular areas, but as I think I've illustrated, these are all interconnected, and uh, obviously in the uh, discussion, we'll hope to bring some of these together. Uh, we have my good friend Joe Serencioni, who will be talking about uh, some of the, uh, the broader issues here, global warming and non-proliferation as, as two sides of one coin. So he's taking us slightly on, uh, beyond part one of our project, but then in the afternoon we bring you back to part one. Uh, and you'll notice we don't have a panel here on the political aspects. We decided the political aspects really saturate the whole issue, so any session on political aspects would be like political science 1A. So what we've done instead is to get two case studies, I think two fascinating ones. One of a country that already has a lot of nuclear energy generation, that's China, and which has massive expansion plans uh, in progress as we speak. Uh, the case of Australia, which is um, considering increasing its uh, export of uranium, but is dithering on the question of whether it actually wants to have nuclear energy generation or not. It currently has none. So there's a case of a completely new entrant into the field. And then finally, we're going to hear from the International Atomic Energy Agency about what its role is in all this. And just from preliminary discussions uh, with Alan McDonald, I've realized that the IAEA can be both a driver and a constraint. It clearly is there to facilitate states uh, wishing to acquire uh, nuclear generation programs that when the agency lays out all the regulations and the requirements to safely and securely and to do that and in a non-proliferation way, states obviously take a step back and say, well, really, do we want to go to all the trouble of this? So perhaps that can act as a constraint as well. And then finally, we have a general discussion where we're looking uh, to you, the audience, to help us uh, with our research avenues and certainly to comment on the way we've structured it and on the substantive issues. So with that, uh, thank you very much. I look forward to the day.